Hey. So, hello, I'm Brian. And I'm Jeff, and we're core members of the Angular team at Google. And we're talking about 1.3 today, which you may have noticed last week we just launched. And Brian, I can't remember much that happened in the last eight months, but I think you and I just sat in a room and coded everything together. And yeah, Igor actually different. locked us up. Uh -huh. uh, he didn't allow us food. We just we wrote the whole thing. Actually, um, I think it might have been a little bit different than that. Yeah, there are actually a couple of people that helped us with this. Um, you guys weren't locked in the room, but uh, you sent us pull requests and stuff all over GitHub. Um, and really, we could not have done it without all of these amazing people. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So over 400 contributors. That was uh, 1,487 commits and 27 beta and release candidates. Those together. are some good numbers. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. So what did we end up doing, or why did we bother doing Angular 1.3? That's a good question. I was actually pretty happy with Angular 1.2. Um, but there were, there were uh, just tons of things that we knew that we could do better, uh, and so we did. Um, there was a huge push on performance, both uh, like runtime speed and memory efficiency. Um, we really wanted to kind of uh, clean up some conceptual things around forms and animations. Um, and then there were just tons of bug fixes and little features and things that we could polish or smooth over to make uh, everyone, everyone's lives a little bit easier. Um, so we, we spent, like Jeff said, uh, a bit over eight months on this. Uh, and so this is just kind of a high level overview or some of our favorite things. Um, if there are features that you've seen or questions that you have about other things in 1.3, um, come find us. We're here all week. Mm -hmm. So we focused on a, a few big things in Angular 1.3, and, and you heard a little bit about it already. Uh, one of the first things was performance, and then we'll talk some more about forms and then developer ergonomics later. All right. Awesome. Let's get to it. Mm -hmm. So performance. Uh, we, we wanted to make things lighter. We wanted to make Angular's overhead less. We wanted to make apps snappier, and so we set out to, to make that a goal. Great. Right. So we just, we just did it, right? Uh -huh. We just like, started in there, just started typing. And, and there, everything was faster, probably. Yeah. Actually, um, we took a little bit more of a measured approach to, to making sure we were actually making good progress. And so we built a tool called BenchPress. Uh, what this does is it allows us to make these macro benchmarks. Can you hear me OK? okay. Okay. Uh, these macro benchmarks that look more like real world applications than a micro benchmark that let us measure things like how much garb is it, garbage is generated, how much memory is retained by certain operations, and how much time things take. Wow. So we did like real science. Yeah, real science almost. Look at yeah, numbers and everything. And so what we found, uh, so, so we actually have in the core repository, we have a handful of benchmarks. One of them is this large table benchmark that has a table with many rows and columns and, and bindings. And what we found with that is that DOM manipulation was, was kind of slow, as should be expected. Uh, but we could optimize it in Angular so that Angular's overhead with DOM manipulation is less. And what we came up with is 1.3 is 4.4 times faster. Uh, and the garbage is 73% less generated from these DOM manipulation activities. Yeah, it might actually be faster, I hear. I think Igor is somewhere with a I, laptop punched over fine, just right? making uh, it even faster. Uh, um, in the digest, we came up with 3.5 3 times faster with 87% less garbage. Wow, that's really impressive. So, like, my Angular app's, like, four times faster now, right? Well, it's still up to you to make your app fast. We just made Angular less overhead so that uh, you have to worry a bit less about how much Angular is taking. Right, but there are still some, pr some free, basically free improvements for me, right, you, if I upgrade? You do get free improvements, and there are some things you can do yourself to make your app faster. Well, tell me more. Okay. We introduced a new mode called production mode. Um, what this is, is you may know that Angular has, uh, lets you see certain things about elements, like you can say angular.element, wrap an element, and get its scope, and it also adds classes to elements to say ng scope, this element has a scope, ng binding, this element has bindings. These kinds of things aren't very useful for most applications, but they're useful for debugging tools like Batarang, which Brian's going to talk about later. Yeah, I heard some rumors about that. Uh -huh, there is are there, rumors. Is there a new one coming? There might be. We'll, okay. we'll have to tune into your talk later tomorrow. Okay. Um, and then also, uh, uh, Protractor uses these things when it's doing end-to-end -end testing to understand elements better. Um, but real applications don't really need these things, and they're kind of expensive to have included. So we have a new mode where you can turn these off with debug in info enabled so that uh, your application can enjoy some of these performance improvements. And you can see some of the improvements here that we've measured. All right. So you're saying just adding like this line to my app makes it go fast? It, it'll help. Yeah. OK. Cool. I'm on board. Um, so, so another thing folks may know, if you use the HTTP service. Oh, I like that service, actually. Yeah, it's a good service. It's pretty good. popular. Yeah, most apps use HTTP in some way or another. <laughs> 
uh, but every time a request resolves, a digest uh, gets triggered. And so we introduced this new service that allows you to configure the HTTP provider to coalesce responses that happen in a short amount of time together so that only one digest is triggered. And we've seen some positive improvements. From right. This. Uh, what if I was writing like a WebSocket service or something? Like, is there some way for me to use this? Absolutely, Brian. Uh, on the root scope, there's a, there's a method called apply async now that uh, you can do the same thing. If you have many things resolving at the same time, you can use apply async and it'll try to coalesce those together. Right, so if you're authoring custom components, take a look at this, it's pretty cool. Okay, so another thing that, that um, you may have heard in the song today is that watchers get added to scopes when, when you do bindings. I remember that uh, part. Data actually, binding is this nice thing. I Angular. teared up a little bit. Yeah. It's very moving. It was moving. Uh, data binding is awesome, and that's what a lot of people come to Angular for, uh, but it comes at a price, and, and watching things isn't free. Um, but we introduced a new API that lets developers take control over when watchers can be removed by saying uh, when, uh, when an expression becomes stable, that means it's no longer undefined when it's evaluated. <coughs> Stop watching it, it's good, leave it, and, and be done with it. Uh, and so you can see here, I have an example that actually has some weird expressions with two colons in front right, of the expression. Right, right uh, here. Watch Brian. Uh -huh. yeah, see. Um, so, so how this works is in my, my table that I have a list of stocks. <coughs> Uh, on this my stocks list, I have two colons in front of it, which says, this isn't going to change. Watch it, uh, parse it, and then be done with it. Don't watch for changes to it. And then each object in this repeater uh, has certain expressions that are bound one time, like the symbol isn't going to change while my app is being used, so I just want to bind it once. Uh, but the current quote of the stock is probably going to keep changing, so I want to leave that binding active. And this expensive expression that calculates the value of a stock I don't want to be doing that on every digest, so I just uh, evaluate this once and I'm done with it. Right, so a key thing here is that this really helps with your memory consumption. Um, mm -hmm. We also have zero time bindings, right, where if you remove <laughs> the double curlies and the colons. Yeah, that's the, that's the best performance yeah. win right there. Don't have expressions at all. <laughs> Uh, so, Brian, I think you wanted to talk a little bit about forms now? Yeah, I did. Um, so, you probably are already using forms. Forms are one of the coolest things, I think, in Angular. You get all these, like, classes, and, you know, you just have to style it. Um, but we thought that we could do even better. But forms are already pretty good in Angular, right? Yeah, I think so. But, like, let's go to, go to the next slide. Let's, let's look at some concrete thing. So, you guys know this thing, right? NG model? Oh. No? Yeah? No. Get some moves? Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> do you guys know about NG model controller? Yeah, yeah, you do some custom forms? Okay, um, so, next slide. Um, one of the cool things that we introduced is validators. So, uh, if you've used this before, you know that there were formatters and parsers that basically said, like, when you're doing data binding, uh, let's change what's coming into the system. So, a good example is, like, a date, right? It starts out as a string, you wanna parse into some sort of object. And then you wanna do the opposite the other way. Um, and so, the cool thing about ng model controller is it lets you hook into Angular's data binding and get all of the niceties of Angular, um, uh, but then also customize it to your own needs. So now we have a separate step just for validators um, that hooks into both, both directions of data binding. Um, so you can add your own custom uh, validity kind of checks, uh, and they just get hooked right into the rest of Angular, so you get all of the, all of the form classes, all of these sort of things. Um, so but, it sounds a little bit complicated. Could you show yeah, a little yeah. bit? Yeah, yeah. I think we might actually have a slide. Oh, oh we, we do. do. We do have a slide. Okay. Um, so let's say you, you have some sort of uh, custom form and you want to make sure that the input contains the word unicorn because um, unicorns are pretty cool. Uh, so all you have to do is create a directive that asks for ng model um, and then you add a new property to validators that is a function. Um, and it just returns true or false, whether or not it contains a unicorn. And then you get all of the validity states and all of this kind of uh, by default. And again, the cool thing is that this works both ways. So, so what if I have a validation that requires something async, like I need to check my server to see if something... Right, that was something before that you couldn't really do like this. You'd have to write a bunch of code in your controller. But now we have async validators that basically work the same way, um, but you return a promise. Right, so you can make a request to your server. Um, a good use case for this is if you want to make sure that uh, a username or something is, um, is unique. Right? You'd have to check your database or something. Um, so again, you can just return a promise, and Angular will hook this into the rest of the forms, and you get this kind of for free. Um, there are a bunch of other things that we added to forms. So there's this new directive called uh, ng model options. 
Um, and one, one thing that we saw a lot of is um, if, you're, if you're doing some sort of autocomplete or something where you need to respond uh, to input with, with some sort of expensive operation, like you know, looking up possible completions in a big dictionary, um, it, could, it could start to get slow. Um, so one thing that, that you might want to do is debounce input. So the user types for a while, and then after they stop, you want to do something in response. Um, so now you can do this, and it hooks right into Angular's data binding. So you can say ng-model-options um, and give it this option debounce with the number of milliseconds to wait um, before kind of committing the new uh, model value. So we created this new directive that just has one option with it? Well, hold on there, Jeff. There are a couple <laughs> options. Uh, next slide. Okay, so maybe another case is that you want to wait until the user um, like unfocuses from a certain thing. Um, so maybe you want to make sure that a credit card number is valid or something like this, right? You wouldn't want to do this as the user is typing because that's nonsense. You want to wait until they're doing something else, right? So you can use um, this update on option and give it any JavaScript event. So like blur or you know, when the mouse comes out of here. There, there are a bunch of different cases, but I think blur is probably the most common. Um, we also now support binding to getters and setters. So quick background, I think most people know this. You probably recognize this from like jQuery. Um, but one common thing to do in model code is to say, instead of having a property that, that you know, tells us something about this, we have a function. And when you call it with zero arguments, it returns the value. And when you call it with one argument, it sets it. Um, so before, you could set up watchers to kind of data bind to this. But now, you can actually just bind directly to this by, by uh, providing this getter setter option. Um, and so one cool thing that you can do now is you can bind directly to dollar location, right? So loca dollar location dot path is a function, um, but if you expose it on the scope and use this option, you can just type in and it binds right to the URL right there. So that's pretty cool. All right, cool. All right, um, but that's not all. Um, there's also this new module and directive called ng messages. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do is handle a common case in forms where you have uh, kind of a bunch of different constraints. Um, but you only want to show one message at a time. You don't want to just clobber your user with all of these all of these different things. But I could do this before. Could you? I could. Yeah. Let's let's take a look. Right. So this is kind of what I'm talking about. Right. You have something that it needs to be an email. It has a required length. Um, it can't be empty. Um, maybe it also needs to be a unicorn. Like you don't know. You you want to um, then provide the user with some messages. So let's see how this looks in current Angular. Right. Like. You want to show just one, one message at a time, probably, right? You don't want to tell the user all these things at once. That's going to be frustrating to them. Um, but to do this, you have to write this really terse, um, like complicated expression in here. So how could we clean this up, we thought to ourselves. And this is what we came up with. Um, so this is ng messages. And so you say, you know, here's an error object uh, corresponding to some form element. And then the order of these things here kind of tells you the prioritization, right? So if um, if it's empty, it'll give you this first message. Um, if you know, it's not empty, but it doesn't satisfy the email constraint, it'll do the next message. And then if it's an email, but it's not quite long enough, then it'll give you this message. So you only get one message at a time. Um, and this really cleans up your code. It makes it much more dry, much more readable. Um, and yeah, I think this actually is a good segue into what you wanted to talk about next. I do want to talk about developer ergonomics. So one of the other big things we wanted to focus on was making some things easier or less painful to do in Angular that were painful to do before. So forms accomplished a lot of that, but there were some other general things we wanted to do. Uh, like SVG. SVG was kind of hard to work with before, especially if you had custom directives using SVG. Um, SVG is special. It's not like why is, it, why is it special? Because it's it's special, and uh, <laughs> you know it's its own namespace inside of HTML, and it, and it doesn't like HTML elements to be inside it. And so we we made directives a little bit right. smarter. It's pretty picky about like which things you can yeah, list it's in not there. Very it likes to throw errors. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Like if you look at your console, SVG will, will yell at you a lot. Um, so things like this were hard to do, where where my graph would, would create an SVG element, and then my plot point would create shapes inside of that element. Um, it, it would break before. Um, but now you can create pretty little graphs like this by adding just another property to your directives called template namespace SVG. And this isn't for templates that are the SVG element themselves, but um, SVG elements within uh, the SVG element. 
if that makes sense. And, right. uh, and uh, this guy right here, I think he helped uh -huh. out with that a lot. Yeah, Ben, ben Lash from Netflix contributed a lot in terms of uh, insight and, and help and some late night pair programming with Igor to make this happen. So uh, big thanks to him for that. Yeah, round of applause. Thank, Thank you, Ben. <laughs> so, Brian, do you know what I hate? What do you hate, Jeff? I hate waste. Oh, me too. You know what I particularly hate? Wasted HTTP requests like this one right here. That would happen when user.id is not uh, evaluating to Right. An HTTP request saved is an HTTP request earned. That's right. That's what Benjamin That's what my grandma said. said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so we added this new thing called all or nothing that will automatically work on the ng attributes like ng source, href, source set, that when this string has uh, expressions that aren't yet defined, uh, this, the uh, interpolate service returns undefined so that source won't be set on this image element uh, requesting this image that probably doesn't exist. Um, so, so now I, I can safely use ng-source in this way and I, I can know that my browser is not going to waste an HTTP request trying to load this resource. Right. ng-source before knew that if this whole thing was empty, not to make the request, but mm -hmm. it wasn't quite smart enough if just part of the expression wasn't defined. Yep. Uh, and it's also available on the interpolate service directly as, as an argument. So if you're using that in, in your directives, you can take advantage of this. Right. So another nice new API, if you had lots of watch expressions with the same handler before, you would have to do hacks where you can concatenate the expression results together or, um, or have multiple watches to, to get the same thing. We introduced a new API just to make that a little simpler. Uh, Brian, have you ever had an app that everything's going well and then you minify it and it starts breaking and the injector complains? Uh, no, I've actually never created a bug before. But you've like, heard of people. Uh, perfect record. Yeah. Good you, you've heard of time. people that make mistakes. Though. Oh, yeah, yeah. I see it on GitHub all the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we introduced uh, this new uh, convenience that will, uh, will help you as you're developing make sure that you're using the correct annotations for minification. Uh, so that you, you don't find these problems later on and, and you hold yourself accountable to this. Right, and I think there's a sweet combo with this and ng annotate. Yeah. Um, right, so you might have heard of ng min that this weird guy wrote. Um, ng annotate is like the better version of that. Mm -hmm. So if you're on ng min, you should switch to ng annotate. Uh -huh. and this will, an this will annotate your services for you right. so you have less boilerplate. Yep, but problem. then you can use the strict DI thing to absolutely be sure that everything is going to work in mm -hmm. production. And it's also available in the config object if you're manually bootstrapping. Just set the strict DI to true. Awesome. Uh, and so something that Marcy, I think, is going to talk about later today, or tomorrow, today, tomorrow, uh, is, is ngaria, this, this new app, which, uh, which Brad and Igor also mentioned, which, which gives you some nice accessibility out of the box. Yep, and this is a totally new module in 1.3. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we covered a lot today. Yeah, but there are a lot of other things. Um, we, we'll, we'll give a, a link to our slides, but here's just a, like a short summary of other cool things. Um, there's also our change log, and there's also migration docs that have more comprehensive uh, notes of what changed. But um, if any of these topics interest you, come find me or Jeff or anyone on the Angular team and talk to us about it, because we're excited about it, and we, we would like to get your feedback on any of these new things. And the one thing we didn't talk about at all was animations, which Matthias is going to talk about in a lot more detail. He's done some nice things with staggering and sequencing, and, um, and he's going to talk about what he has done and what's also on the horizon for animations in Angular 1.3. All right, so that's all we got. But um, yeah, stay tuned for more tomorrow. And here's a, a link to our slides now, but I think we'll distribute more links later today that are easier to remember than this one. All right, that's all we got. Thank you. Thank you.